Good afternoon there, Dr. Heather McKee. Thank you so much for joining me again on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a privilege after we've worked out five years since the original. Yeah, it's classic. Um, I must say, uh, I was I was actually listening to the podcast uh, this oh, yeah. week that we did, and I was like, "Wow, we actually sounded quite intelligent." You know, I was quite impressed with us. Oh, <laughs> um, no. I think that might have been you and Craig, not me. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. But you, uh, last time we spoke, you said that whenever you went home back to Ireland, that your family said you sounded like the Queen because yeah. you sounded British. <laughs> now, obviously, you're living back in Ireland now, so I wonder, has the accent returned fully? Yeah, I yeah, I find myself saying funny little things. And actually, do you know what? I, I find myself saying um, words in Irish, like in, in Gaelic, like the Irish language, or Gaelic, as we call it, um, more often now, because before, if I said something, I'd be so worried that, uh, you know, someone would be like, what are you talking about gobbledygook or what is this? And because I remember originally when I moved to UK um, for, for university um, and I'd say a few words every now and again, just, you know, out of habit. And uh, people would be like, what are you saying? You know, and, and, and so I had to train myself not to say it. But now I have to kind of train myself back into it and, and let myself know that it's OK, because I don't know, I feel like the Irish language is such a it's a dying language and it's nice to kind of keep it alive you know all, all the stuff that we've learned in school and it's such a big part of our heritage so now I don't speak it beautifully or fluently in any way anymore but I like to as they say in Ireland Irish uh, a few words and um, keep a few words going it's so it is a beautiful language but it's also like I mean it's such a hard one to um, it, it's definitely not phonetic, is it? That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I remember working with some like uh, Irish people when when I was back in London, and they I would look at their names and I would go, "Okay, I know that it's not what I think it is, so I'm going to have a stab at something else." And it was generally yeah. wrong, but it's like <laughs> it's so classic how how the names are definitely not phonetic, and you have to actually know what they are to pronounce them correctly. Yeah, and it's it's listen everyone's gonna get it wrong like it's it's just impossible even in in Ireland like we're just yeah we even struggle here as well so um yeah we don't make it easy for people yeah that's for sure um I just wanted to kick this off with with kind of like I've, I've been listening to a lot of your podcasts that you've done recently with other people which have, which have been all <laughs> fascinating so you know Great I mean perseverance <laughs> no 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 you you really have uh, you know a lot to share and uh, it's it's nice to listen to it's just nice to listen to smart people to be honest with you um uh, you've also written you write a lot you know so I, I as part of research you slash stalking you, you um a guest you know um before before uh, we have this chat um one of the things that you wrote recently um was that you you wondered why like people that care for others don't necessarily care for themselves. And that was some work that you did for the NHS. So kind of along those lines, I was wondering, like, as a behavior change expert, like, how often do you kind of, like, assess or reassess your own behavior? Oh, great question. Um, constantly, I think. Yeah, all the time. Um there, I think, you know, the reason that we gravitate towards certain areas is because we've got such a curiosity about them. And, and I, I feel really lucky to be in my area because, you know, I can constantly have self experiments and, and do things. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm constantly asking myself the question, actually, even just before we came on this podcast, I came in and I was like, right, I need to hang the washing. I need to do this other thing. I need to send these four emails. And, and then I was like, Hmm, let's just take a pause for a second what what do I really need because those are the shoulds and not the needs and I was like do you know what I need to sit down cup of tea have a piece of chocolate and look out the window for five minutes you know and and I was like do that first because we always you know do all the other things and then we're like then I'll get around to looking after me um and so yeah no I did that first and I was really proud of myself because I think like like you say like you know every time you kind of take action on something you prove to yourself that it's possible and it, even just a small action like that is you know an important way of kind of 
showing and demonstrating to yourself that you do have time to take care and, and mind yourself. And it's certainly something that I try to translate through the kind of evidence-based practices to the NHS carers, um, which were the group that we were talking about self-compassion with, who unfortunately are the ones that need to care for themselves the most, but yet care for themselves the least. But it's certainly something, yeah, I'm constantly, I'm a, definitely a constant work in progress, I would say. I'm constantly, I've got loads of uh, loads of work to do so I'm a great um I'm a great kind of experimental ground for all of the practices that I preach mm, I think that's super cool I think it's like like living consciously uh and with intention is such like a cool thing to do you know like you you just become so much more aware and so much more presence with how you are like how you interact with people and um it is actually quite easy, but I think so many people are just, they're not like that, you know, and they're, they're kind of worrying about the next thing or thinking about the future. Like, you know, you were saying like, you know, before this, you were like, oh, I've got to hang up the washing and all this. And then oh, yeah. actually, so I'm thinking about all these things I got to do, but but I'm not really enjoying what I'm doing now, you know, and, you know, now I should be having a cup of tea and, and a bit of chocolate. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, where I think we're so disconnected with our kind of inner intuition in a way. Um you know, that we we kind of let our to-do list guide us as to what is best in our day rather than actually asking ourselves, well, what, what is best for me? Like, what are my needs? Um, there's a beautiful exercise um, by, a, see that here, I'm going to go down the study route, total nerd, here we go, get ready for the papers. Um, you know, there's a, a researcher called uh, Dr. Kristen Neff, and she does research in self-compassion, and she's got this great exercise, which is called the self-care check-in. And it's about pausing kind of multiple times a day and asking yourself, what do I need in this moment to nourish myself? And you kind of walk through it in your head. So it may be that you haven't had a glass of water in a while, or, you know, you've got all the windows closed and you're getting too warm, or, um, you know, you haven't had your lunch, or, um, but you can kind of go through this and ask yourself, well, what are my physiological needs? Do I need any of those? Um, and then you can ask yourself, well, actually, maybe this is a psychological need. Maybe I just need a break right now, or I need to step away from a screen right now, or I need to go play with my dog right now. You know, maybe it's an emotional need. Maybe I need to soothe or comfort myself. Maybe I need to, you know, ring my granny and have a, a positive chat or watch a funny video on YouTube or have a laugh. Um, but what I think is quite beautiful about asking yourself, you know, what do I need in this moment to nourish myself beyond kind of, you know, just food and, you know, external stimulants. It's actually you're training yourself in that intuition of, of learning what you need and, and, and making that voice feel heard and recognized and understood, which is really important because this is going to sound really woo-woo, but like we're, we're all quite wise when we peel back the layers. We just get a bit, our intuition gets a bit shrouded or clouded by kind of all the shoulds and the external and the extrinsic noise in our lives. But if we kind of tune in and, and train ourselves to actually ask ourselves, what are my needs right now? And, and look beyond those kind of normal needs that we may think that we have. Look at that social, look at that emotional needs, look at those psychological needs. You know, we can really start to nourish ourselves in a, in a, in a different way, but ultimately a more kind of productive and kinder way. I was wondering, based on what you said there, like the shoulds and 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 those sort of things, like, do you think people like the, the whole should, I should do this, I should be seen, you know, seen to be doing this. Do you think that is because people are lacking like something? Is it, is it confidence within themselves that they, what they're doing or is it courage? Um, are they afraid like to, to not do some, to do something like sort of uh, different because of what people think? Like, I don't know, it seems to be something that's quite common, but I was just wondering is like courage and confidence, something that you notice that, that mi is missing a lot from people yeah, great question. And I would say, you know, it's no one factor. Um, I think it probably is a culmination of multiple factors for people. It might be, um, you know, their socialization or their life experience or different things that might have happened to them in the past or their personal confidence um, or lack thereof of confidence. And I know a lot of kind of shoulds 
when we kind of peel back the layers and look at well you know if we ask someone why do you feel this way oh well I want to do that because I want to feel useful why do you need to feel useful um oh, because you know my mother acted in this way or you know in society um, women are meant to be useful and um, whatever it happens to be if you ask yourself why enough times you can kind of peel back the layers and say well actually oh god this is actually an inherent inherent and limiting belief that I have that actually you know I'm punishing myself for something that maybe I don't necessarily need to do and it's 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 quite interesting how we have these kind of inner daily battles with ourselves about multiple little things that actually no one else is making us do there's no one you know I always say it's not Santa isn't standing up there you know watching us with his naughty list ready to like uh, cross us off at the last minute but yet we we create this in our mind, you know, and we're constantly saying, well, if I don't do this, I'm not good enough. Or if I haven't done that, I'm not productive enough. And we put ourselves under a lot of pressure. And again, that's not our fault. That's often a societal thing, you know, and um, we're all kind of, we live in an economy where more is more and, you know, we've got to be more efficient, send more emails, make more money, have more friends, have more social media followers, you know, more and more and more. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important to kind of fight that rising tide and be like, this is enough. I mm. feel like I should do that, but I'm going to take a pause and not do that. And what's going to happen? Things aren't going to be ruined, you know, and, 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 and actually often in that case, certainly from the literature, what they find is asking yourself, well, what, what's the worst case scenario here? And is that something that I can cope with? What would I do if that happened? So the worst case scenario for me, if I left the washing up, you know, and I haven't, uh, you know, put it away properly is that someone would come around and God forbid someone would see that I didn't put up the washing in the right way. Um, and then they'd understand that I'm human too. And maybe that would give them permission in future to not have to have everything fully perfect when someone else comes around. And, you know, you, when, you, when you start to rationalize it, you realize, geez, I put myself under so much pressure to do all these things. And yet it's, it's so unnecessary. You know what? <laughs> We're all so similar, aren't we? Like, it, it's quite fascinating. Even though humans are these complex creatures, like, we actually, so much of us is like so similar, you know, the things we worry about. Did um, you leave your washing the, up? <laughs> well, I mean, I always think about doing my washing, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> I'm actually thinking about it now. I'm like, oh man, I don't know if this is going to dry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it's, it is fascinating though, like, you know, how we are these complex creatures, but actually our, our needs and our wants and our worries are, are quite similar. A lot of the time. I, when you peel back all the layers, isn't it ultimately, you know, that we just want to be accepted and, and, and loved and, and, and feel safe and secure as, as humans, you know, like if we ask ourselves enough wise, you know, maybe, maybe 10 wise rather than five, you know, we can kind of get to that core and that, that in essence is the core of self-compassion. It's about understanding, you know, that we make mistakes or that we're not perfect or we don't, you know, put up the washing every single time or, you know, we, we don't get to inbox zero or um, recycling bin zero or dishwasher zero or whatever it happens to be um, and forgiving ourselves for that and being like, that's OK. That doesn't make me unlovable as a human. That doesn't make me an unproductive person. That doesn't make me an unfriendly person or um any of these things that's just part of human life and yet you know we we often reserve that forgiveness for others but we're we're very scant with that forgiveness for ourselves and i i would say that's a training process it's not something that comes easy it's simple in concept it's not easy i've been practicing it for 20 15 20 years now and um, you know because as an academic you're trained to be critical and so you're training your brain to find critique, you're finding holes, you know, lawyers would understand this too. And hence why, you know, the law community is some of the worst mental health of any of the um, business sectors out there. We're all, we're looking for holes, we're looking for ways to critique. So we're training our brain to be really good at that. Um, and the more often we do it, the more we repeat that behavior, the more we hardwire that into our brain. So then the next time we're in the same situation, habitually our non-conscious brain, so our non-thinking brain, our automatic brain, just cues us into thinking in that. And I think that's something that, you know, I, I talk a lot about habits and I'm sure we'll get on and, and chat it 
a lot about habits in a, in a bit but you know one thing that we neglect to really understand is our thoughts our habits too and our ways of thinking our habits and and so those you know i would say even more so necessarily than our physical habits the habits that we can see are really really important to acknowledge to understand and to address yet they're very very hard to push the needle in a quick a quick amount of time they take a long time and a lot of persistence and unfortunately that's unsexy and not very inviting but that is the reality of it but the bonus is you know you can do it over time it just takes sticking with it and it takes understanding that actually what comes out on the other side having those kinder having those more, more compassionate thoughts or whatever way you want to reframe your thinking is going to be just make for such a nicer life for yourself 100 percent agree the internal dialogue is i think something we don't think about enough you know like i mean we probably talk to ourselves more than we talk to anybody in the world you know we always like like you said we're always critiquing ourselves you know or we thinking about something in the future or whatever and we, we we don't take notice enough of that of that voice in our head i think um but we we also and well, we also scared to. yeah we scared to too but but also like we we actually have an influence over that voice too you know like we can almost trick it i guess you know to to sort of think a little bit differently if we create good habits you know like i'll, I'll use my example like every morning um, I will sit down and I'll write down, um, cool, think three things I'm grateful for, uh, three things uh, that will make today great, and like one affirmation. Um, and then at the end of the day, I will sit down and I'll write, cool, three awesome things that happened today and like what could have made today better. But the, those things in the morning that I write, like, you know, what could make, to, what will make today great, like literally makes me think wow, how can this be a great day? You know, like it's a positive thought um, yeah. as opposed to worrying about stuff that might happen. I'm like, cool, how can I make this a great day? And, you know, it's a tool I, th I feel like I actually need, you know, even though mm -hmm. I, I also feel lucky that I've been sort of whacked with the, the sort of more optimistic, positive stick when I was born or something like that, but I still need <laughs> these tools, that, you know? That's the birthing ceremony. Whack them with the positivity stick. Yeah, it's an African thing, especially. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I don't know if you like, you know, if you sort of agree with that, like you, you, you can sort of um, help yourself um, to think a little bit differently and, and that it's also kind of a, a good exercise to do. Yeah, absolutely. Just like getting up and, you know, doing your mobility exercises in the morning, you're training your mind for positivity. Um, one thing I like to do is, um, I because I noticed over time that I kind of would wake up in the morning and I talked to a few friends and colleagues and, and others about this you know I, I have this impending sense of dread like oh I need to ring you know the bank and then I need to do this other thing and oh then I have to kind of sit through this other thing and you know all the things that you're thinking of oh I have to do and and then I would say well what am I looking forward to today um, and I would just try and think of, you know, oh, I'm going to see a friend for a cup of coffee or I'm going to have a, a walk in the park or I'm going to go for a cycle later or, um, you know, I'm looking after a friend's car and that's always really fun or whatever it happens to be. Um, and it, it, like yourself, it kind of helped me, you know, stop thinking about how hard everything was going to be and start thinking about what I was going to look forward to. Um, but like I, what I would say, like for people listening is, don't be hard on yourself if you do think in that way, because that's natural. Like our brains are hardwired for the negativity, you know, and um, Darth, you'll know this, you know, more than most people, but, you know, like our brains evolved to be more hardwired towards the negative because, you know, it allowed us to survive, um, you know, back in the day when we had to anticipate threat. So those people that were more anxious or taught in a more pessimistic way, we're more likely to spot a tiger or a dinosaur or whatever it happened to be that was a threat. Um, and unfortunately, our brains have kind of evolved with that, with that negativity towards the bias or, or that negativity bias. But the reason, you know, it, it's, it's there to keep us safe, essentially. And if we can acknowledge that, oh, I'm thinking this way because my brain's just trying to keep me safe. It's just trying to look after me. Um, and our, you know, two thirds of our neural structure is already built in. But one third is, is based on the thoughts and emotions you express the most. 
And so practices like your morning kind of gratitude practice or your morning thinking about what I'm looking forward to practice or reflecting at the end of the day, like you mentioned, you know, those are all increasing the amount of positive thoughts you have, increasing the amount of moments that you're thinking about and what am I looking forward to, increasing kind of just addressing that negativity bias because the negativity bias, like it shows up in so many ways. You know, if we see a negative emoji, we give it five times um, the attention that we would a positive one. If we get a negative email, I think it's something like 12 to 17 times more energy than a positive one. And it's just the way our brains are hardwired. And so, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, toxic positivity and all of that. And yeah, absolutely. You know, we don't want to deny our feelings and just, you know, paint everything as being perfect. But we also want to acknowledge that we tend to sit in pessimism in negativity, in fear, way more than we do in positivity, in uplifting, in optimism, in forgiveness, and all of these things. And so these practices help us just readdress that balance a little bit more. Mm. Yeah, fascinating and, and, and really important, I think, for, for people to be conscious of that. Um, it's kind of a nice segue because I've been thinking a lot recently about like um, masculine and feminine energy. And obviously, these are, you know, you would think like, okay, men are more masculine, women are more feminine. And I think generally they are, but actually, we, we both possess these energies within us. I don't know if that's something that like, you know, as part of your guys study as like behavior experts that, you know, you guys sort of take reference to, um, because it's generally considered, I suppose, a more kind of Eastern philosophy. Um, but is that something you guys ever think about or consider? Uh, it's such an interesting question. Can you explain to me a little bit more about what an example would be of a masculine or a feminine energy? Sure. So like a feminine energy is someone that's probably a bit more nurturing, a bit more um, loving. Um, it's also uh, like more chaos, uh, a bit disorganized um, and maybe like goes with the flow. And then the masculine energy is more about like sort of action taking, structure, um, um, you know, like a, a, a sort of strong hand and direct kind of energy. Um, so, you know, you often do find that like, you know, guys are a bit more like that and, and women are a bit more, you know, say feminine. And, and this is actually where, um, a lot of, I think relationships fail is because we don't actually understand each other's energies, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, like say a guy that he's like very organized and, um, you know, he, him and his wife have a child and, uh, the wife is like a little bit more like, um, chaotic cause she's also looking after the child. And then you, and then he's like, why is she not doing this? And why is she not doing that? And then there's just these sort of big sort of eruptions because they don't actually understand that, you know, they are really different people and they have these different type of, um, tendencies towards these different energies. Um, so, you know, things ultimately fail because people then don't understand it and they don't talk about it. Um, so those are the kind of things. I don't know if that makes it a bit more clear. Yeah, it does. And I wouldn't say that I've done any particular research on masculine or feminine energies. Um, but from where you're from what you're talking about, it makes me think of, you know, one thing that I get asked an awful lot at the end of my talks, actually, there's always two questions I get asked is how long does it take to break a habit? And how do we support other people that want to create change in their lives? Or how do we get other people to support us when we're, we're going through changes? And this will be relevant, so bear with me. Um, but, you know, one of the things in terms of support is that often we don't understand what type of support works best for us. And we don't understand what type of support those others in our, our lives have strengths in. Um, and so, you know, we often think, oh, so-and-so isn't supporting me, you know, say with, you know, um, after just having a child, um, but we haven't asked for support or we haven't directed them for support. So when we talk about that masculine energy, maybe, you know, your other half is someone that needs structure. And so actually asking for support in a really structured way um, can actually really help them in, you know, feel empowered to help you, or maybe they're a really direct person. So they need to be told directly, well, actually, I need to do these childcare things. So I need you to do the, you know, the car registration and, you know, um, cleaning out the shed and doing the hoovering and doing the laundry or whatever it happens to be that, you know, are attentive to your strengths. Um, 
and this is where a lot of people fall down when it comes to seeking social support is they don't understand firstly what type of support do they need um, and what type of support is going to be most helpful for them in the situation as well as the other person's strengths and support um, and I would say, you know, if you're if you're like, I don't know what type of support works well for me, um, it might be useful to do a bit of support audit just over the next couple of days and just reflect on, OK, well, you know, when was a time you know, it's going to make me sound like I'm interviewing you now. But, you know, when was a time in work where you found, felt you were really supported or when you were in university or you did a, you know, a course or a bit of education where you felt really supported or. Um, you know, what are those people that you gravitate towards on social media? You know, what type of support types do they give? Are they those nurturing people? And are those the words that you need to hear? And often a way of actually really understanding what kind of support, what kind of words you need to hear is to ask yourself, it's an exercise I often do. Um, I've totally spoiled the exercise now, but um, I'll, I'll, like, I'll talk you through it quickly. Um, I'm in um, some of my self-compassion talks where I get people to, you know, to sit down kind of um, in, their, in their minds with a friend and, and say they've got five minutes with that friend and the friend is going through a bit of a struggle. Um, maybe it's, you know, there's a new, new child in the house and they're trying to work out their roles and understand how they can divide labour without, you know, um, biting off their other half's head. Um, or, you know, maybe they're they're trying to, um, you know, achieve a, a certain goal in life at work or physically or whatever it happens to be. And, and I say, okay, you've got five minutes with this friend. You know, what are the words that this friend needs to hear? What are the words of encouragement that they need to hear right now? What would you tell them? And, and we are, I get people to write this down. And it's often things like, you know, you're doing the best that you can with the resources that you have. Please ask for my help. I'm here for you. All of these kind of really kind things. And then I get them to read it back. And later I get to them to use this language because actually the language that we write down that we would give to a friend is actually the exact language that we need to hear ourselves. Mm -hmm. And those are the exact support strategies that we often need to have for ourselves. And it's a really insightful exercise because naturally we're also good at kind of lending support and seeing how other people need support. You know, we're tribal beings, um, but it's that internal support and the understanding that we miss. And so maybe that nurturing support or maybe that structured support or like you talk about, you know, it might be masculine energies or feminine energy. Um, and that's the kind of support you need. But actually, really go through that exercise. Or if you just notice over the next couple of days when you're chatting with a friend or who you gravitate towards in social media or kind of what books are you reading? What support are you looking for? Um, that will give you a bit of guidance into actually what support is, again, going back to the Chris and Neff exercise, it's going to be most nourishing or most supportive of you now. And then the second piece is really asking um, other people, you know, what kind of support works best for them or how best can you empower them to support you and talking that through as well. Because they may say, yeah, actually asking me direct questions instead of being passive aggressive is going to be a lot more helpful. Or um, I'm actually, you know, not very quick to see those things that you see on this. Maybe, you know, that's a task for you. And actually, I'm going to manage these things because I know that I have more capabilities of this. And so we need to empower and enable people if we want to support them. You know, we're not mind readers and we don't really fully understand or know our own ways of needing support, let alone others. And so we need to be a little bit more vocal around that if we want to get the support that we need. Yeah, I really like that. Um, I, I wish there was like more people like you that would be sort of giving advice um, or direction to people that are sort of in leadership roles um, particularly in corporate you know like I look back on when I was say um, back in the day like investment banking and, and had a team and stuff and I'm just like my word I, I I could have been so much better as like a manager if I actually you know was say the person I am now because I just understand things better you know and this is this is one of them you know like just trying to actually understand, okay, cool. What are the needs um, of your of your employees on an individual basis? Because they are all different. Um, you know, like even something which sounds quite crazy, but um, you know, around say sleeping. Like some people are some people are morning people, and some people are evening people. And if we just understood that, you know what I mean? Like I remember, like I had say uh, like some some girls in the team that were definitely uh, not morning people. 
right? Um, and you know, you could you could you just have so much more understanding, compassion, but also flexibility. Like you could say, cool, I know you're not a morning person. Like come in at ten o'clock, no worries. Then just stay a little bit later on. Um, and and the opposite for for people that are morning people and are not evening people. Like cool, you well you come come in early and then you can leave early as well. Like. I think there's so much to sort of management and leadership that uh, is not really taught, you know, and and understood that would make the workplace uh, a much sort of more collaborative and 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 better place to to work if we if we understood these things better. Yeah, no, you're so right. But I, I think it it often starts with your own personal self awareness. Um, you know, you kind of have to practice on yourself a little bit before. You start kind of extending it to others and um and it's hard it's hard to do you know it's not something that we're ever taught but it's definitely a skill to understand you know when when does your energy dip in the day and what is how how is it best to manage that you know if we a lot of us are you know big i'm big big into tracking you know i wear an aura ring or you know other people wear like a fitness watch and everything else and i know when my energy is good um, for certain tasks, when I know when my energy is bad, but only because I have a really heightened awareness around it. But it, it's something that's really important for people to know and understand. So, for example, I try and take meetings in the afternoon because I know that actually I've got good social energy in the afternoon, but I don't have good deep thinking energy at that time of day. Whereas in the morning, I like to have the stillness through reading and reflection. Now, I have the ability um, and the privilege to be able to orchestrate my day as much as I wish to. Um, but even to a certain extent where you know that about members of your team, where you know that with others that you're working with, okay, this person actually works really well in the morning for creative thinking. When we're going to have that really important brainstorm, that's when we're going to pull them in. Or actually, yeah, the whole team needs a lift after lunch. The best time to do those kind of stand-up meetings or those more energetic pieces is, is then. Um, and even when we're talking about this physically, you know, um, I know that last time, you know, we talked um, with Craig as well, obviously, given his background about, you know, using standing desks and sedentary behavior and doing walking meetings and all of that, like knowing how your energy kind of dips and flows throughout the day can really give you some really, really interesting insights into how to work with that energy, both socially and physically in work. Um, and then there's another layer on top of that as well. And it's something that if anyone is a leader or a manager can do right now, um, which is understanding more about your strengths. Um, and the founder of uh, positive um, psychology, Martin Seligman, he was um, kind of prolific in creating this um, particular questionnaire, which is called the VIA Strengths Questionnaire, which is freely available online. And I always encourage people to do it. And what it does is it points to your character strength. Um, and what they found in studies is that those that actually focus on the character strengths that come out on top from this survey, um, they, they just live happier, healthier, more productive, more engaged lives. Um, and it's also useful to know as a manager, as a leader, okay, where are the pe my people's strengths? Um, in my team, because then you can start to actually really work into those and encourage those people and empower them around their own personal strengths. Because I know for myself, you know, I spent an excessively long time in university, but I didn't know my strengths. If I'd have really known, okay, you know, actually, this is where I really, really excel. I think I would have leaned into that a lot more and, and really actually that would have given me a lot more confidence. Um, rather than, you know, trying to constantly do all of the things and try and do them all well and, you know, to my own detriment. Um, and I, so it's something that I definitely encourage people to do is like, think about your energy, think about your awareness, you know, when are, do you feel more energized? When do you feel more engaged throughout your day for particular tasks? And then also look at your strengths and your team strengths. Um, and it's called VIA. Um, strength survey you can just google it it's, it's freely available online and that can give you a lot of insight into what works best for you mm, that's awesome i love that um such great advice i i think a lot about leadership and one thing that which has been been coming up for me lately and it's just a thought right it's something i'm kind of like processing still i don't really have any any sort of clear direction on on what my my take on it is I recently became a father and I've been thinking that like in say, maybe, maybe just the corporate environment, not like sports or something like that, but as a leader, like 
a true leader, like almost to be well-rounded, you almost need to like be a parent um, because I don't know, it just gives another dimension uh, and understanding to, to humans um, that, that might be in your team. Uh, I don't know if that's like, like crazy talk or if it makes any sense to you. Hey, tell me a little bit more about that. No, I just, I don't know. I just think like for, for me being a dad now, I, I don't know. I just have a lot more sort of, um, maybe, um, understanding compassion for, for people that sort of are parents themselves and, um, you know, uh, are married and, and, and parents and going through, through tougher times. And, you know, like, I think it just helps you to just to understand humans better once you, uh, once you have a child It also, I don't know, it, 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 it makes you kind of like a little bit more in a way in some elements carefree and therefore um, maybe more flexible as well, you know, and that's a, that's quite an important trait, I think, as, as a leader, um, because you, you know, you understand like your, your kids are these little balls of fun that uh, remind you to kind of have fun, you know, and um, yeah. So, so that's kind of like a, a little bit, like I said, I'm still processing these thoughts mm. myself um but i yeah i just think it's like a an interesting thing like I, I don't know if there's ever been any studies on it like people that are parents are better leaders in the workplace than than people that are not i don't know no. yeah i know and i would i don't know either but i think it's a really interesting question it kind of goes back to your other reflection about you know if only you had been the way you are now when you were back in in finance and it's it's kind of in in essence like life experience and, and understanding and and obviously you know through your work even you know this work you know your ability to kind of or meet with people that have different point of views taking people from different backgrounds understanding bringing the curiosity to that all of those are all skills that have obviously brought you to where you are now and the parenting is a whole new kind of like that but kind of a fast track skill onto that um, and so I'm curious, is it like a life experience thing? Is it a parent thing? You know, is it, you know, making mistakes and, and actually, you know, um, learning, bumbling our way through that? Is that what 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 his book kind of brings about, you know, your clarity and leadership? Um, I'm afraid I don't have any answers and more like questions. But I think it's a brilliant, brilliant question. No worries. Um, and another thing kind of like uh, along those lines is, uh, there's a really fascinating lady. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard of her or not, but her name is Dr. Shafali Tarberry. She's um, uh, she's a like a, a well-known sort of um, psychologist and, and written some like great books around family and stuff. She wrote a really interesting book called The Conscious Parent, and um, I guess the overarching message in the book is that your child will teach you more about you uh, or your child is going to teach you more than you are going to be able to teach your child and wow. I was that's like kind of like whoa that's kind of a big a big statement you know but it's it's very true actually when you are conscious as a parent and because your kid is effectively showing you a lot of your programming uh, that is possibly stuff you've never resolved um, it's showing you your shadows you know like you, you might get angry at certain things or you might push them to do certain things. And um, so it's really interesting. Like when I, when I think of like say personal development and growth and I look at people now and I'm like, okay, cool. Have you had a kid yet? Like, <laughs> you know, um, because they're going to, you know, you can read all the books you want. You can do all the kind of meditation and yoga and whatever other exercises and um, you know, whatever it is, but like, you know, have you had a kid yet? Because they're, if you are very conscious, they're going to really help you with your growth as a human. Um, it just, I just thought it's a, it's a really interesting thing to consider. Mm, and, and as you say as well, like your value stance on life, you know, where you stand on so many things, you know, you're constantly asked questions, questions about death, about life, about why does this, you know, how do bees make honey even like, you know, all of these things that actually you have to kind of, stop for a second and, and 
be conscious and, and actually intentional about your response, which is, you know, not something that we often have to do in our day to day lives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the last few years have been crazy, haven't they? I mean, well, now it's sort of settled down a little bit uh, with, with COVID and everything. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming as a behavior change expert that it was like a fascinating time for you because, I mean, we, well, we've never experienced anything like that. You know, everyone's sort of cooped up at home and, and whatnot. And, you know, the behavior change um, and the way people were like, I mean, it was probably a great thing for you to kind of observe, I'm, I'm assuming. W was there anything that like specifically stood out for you or that you noticed? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I think I think it was an interesting time for people because for it was both hard and nice for some people in in different ways as well. And I think a lot of people were afraid to express that. Actually, that I, I think for me, like looking back on it, it was the big reflection. You know, it gave, it kind of took away all of the noise and all of the distractions and helped us kind of get back to what matters most in life you know and um a huge part of that was social connections a huge part of that was mental health a huge part for some people who were privileged enough was um you know reconnection with nature or um you know understanding what mattered most to people in life so, you know we afterwards we saw the, you know the big resignation and all these shifts and um, the way people work and the way that they relate to others and it actually gave so many people who you know again we're in a really privileged um society we're in a privileged position in life but time to reflect on what mattered most to them and, and and actually was this way of working what works for them or were they just kind of going along with it because that's what they thought that they had to do um and i i think those kind of shake-ups are, are really important in life and often we don't really get them unless we kind of go on a gap year or we have our first child or, you know, we have these kind of maybe a psychedelic experience or some sort of life changing experience or God forbid, you know, are in an accident where we're actually given a, a second, a moment and a pause for reflection and to ask ourselves, you know, is this the way that I want to live my life? Is this working for me? Um, so in a way, like if I was to just look at it from a positive side, I would say that's the gift that that pause has given gave a lot of people um, and you can see it from you know if you if you picked out 10 of your friends or colleagues you know how many of those are in the same position that they were pre-covid you know how many of them are still going into the office how many of them still live in the same places how many of them are in different relationships how many are in you know different houses how many have children you know um it was a real shift that i think was was necessary for people unfortunately there are kind of lag um negative effects on on some people some people have recognized that you know social interaction is so important um and and you know they've leaned into that for others um there's still a little bit of fear there um even even now um you know i i see it i see it in family members i see it in friends you know in ireland we have a great tradition of just calling in for people to people's houses you know you just drop in for a cup of tea now it feels like you know you've got pre-warned someone you've got to text them because it's kind of rude just to show up at someone's house or you know almost offensive um to show up at someone's house and um, for a cup of tea and i'm hoping that we can get back to that kind of friendly spontaneous nature but for now um you know that's something through covid that we actually have have learned and, and, and need to unlearn over time um but as you say you know it was a fascinating education in in human behavior um a really interesting i think it just showed us that like how much we need other people how much we need support and how much um you know social connection is is so important to our lives i there was a i was living in hackney in london at the time and there was a poster outside our house and it had some markers next to it and it said um when this is all over what will you miss um and you know people were writing like bird song or you know like um playing games like you know friday night drinks on uh, with my friends on, on zoom or um having time to read the books that i always promised myself i would or um various different things um and i thought that that was really really interesting and 
you know, I'd love for people to kind of go back because I often reflect on, geez, how lucky am I now that I can travel? Um, you know, how lucky am I now that I can go see my granny? Um, you know, how lucky am I now? And I think it's important to not lose sight of, you know, those things that we did learn at that time and, and carry those learnings through our life. I think that's awesome. I mean, it's it's always good to pull out the positives, you know, because it was a was a very strange time. And I don't mm. I don't think maybe like people reflect on it like that um necessarily you know busy now <laughs> yeah, yeah true yeah. we've kind of got ourselves into the into the loop we promised ourselves that we yeah, wouldn't do yeah, but yeah. um I, I'm not I'm curious Gartha is there anything that you feel like you've carried it through from 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 that period carried through as in like something that happened during that period that yeah, I'm now like sort of that you've, you've learned I think I, I mean I I I, I went Personally, I, I didn't really uh, take a lot of what was going on. Like, um, like okay, so, so I think there was a lot of herd mentality, like in terms of what happened. Um, and people were very obedient, like in terms of listening to leadership, where I, th- I personally think that, that leadership was a lot of the time finger in the air, like they didn't really know what they were doing and they were being told certain things and all following each other um so I I don't know like I I was very skeptical about a lot of the stuff that was going on that was that was said um so the maybe I don't know if I carried anything through but I I think I learned a lot about people you know mm. like um the psychology of people you know like how how they don't question things enough personally mm. if i if i'm honest like I, I i think too many people just took what was said by authority for you know for granted and and believed it um and i think it's quite obvious now that that a lot of the stuff was not the right sort of response um so so that was very interesting to me you know like people that i really considered like smart and like forethinkers and leaders like effectively weren't questioning things strongly enough if I if I'm truly honest you know so so that was like kind of the big lesson in it for me you know like that um yeah I don't know I don't know I just think um people 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 should be more questioning of of certain things you know like in in all areas of life so so that was the big one for me and also like I guess just understanding like that there is herd mentality that people like you know, will like go with what everyone says because that's what everyone is doing, you know? Um, so, and, and, and they, they weren't. And that's just a, that's yeah. good advice for life. You know, do we check in, you know, are we, are we just, you know, like, for example, with work, you know, we did the commute because for years, because we were like, well, that's what we need to do. That's what we have to do. That's what we feel like we should do. That's a normal part of life. And now a lot of people that, you know can work from home or have that flexibility or like why did I ever do that but that was just what we did wasn't it no for sure for sure and and actually it ties in with something I, I think a lot about now lately is like tolerance as a as a human behavior and that I think it's like now personally I think it's like not a strong it's actually quite a weak human behavior tolerance you know like uh you, it can get you in a mess you know, if you, if you tolerate things like on, on a small scale, um, say like in your relationship, like, um, someone constantly treats you badly or or talks negatively about you or, or whatever, like, but you tolerate that, you know, like it's, it's, it's not, a, it's not a good thing because that, that sort of, um, leads to kind of disdain and, and, and not liking the person and stuff. Um, and, you know, on a, on a grander scale, like tolerating, you know, like you said, like, why have we always commuted into work and not, not questioned it more? Like, you know, we, we actually, we should do these sort of things. So, um, so, so yeah, like, I don't know. I just, I just think, um, well, that's just something that I've been thinking about tolerance, although tolerance does allow you to kind of like carry on, you know, like, um, Mm. effectively. Um, so, so yeah, I just, I don't know, that's just a bit of a (laughs) sort of side thing there. And actually on that note, I've, uh, there was a really good book. I, part of this nerdy group of um kind of colleagues from different organizations that I've worked with um 
across the world and um we have, we're, have a book club and one of the books that we read recently was this um i've got it actually right here um it's called connect it's by david bradford and carl robin um and they they talk about how you know we're never taught how to have relationships with people you know we're never and yet it's one of the most important aspects of our entire lives and they talk about how to have relationships in work in life um but they talk about um pinches which I think is kind of similar to your concept of um, tolerance about, you know, there's those things that keep coming up and they often say, like, don't let a pinch turn into a crunch. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, how can we, you know, start to notice those little things that are kind of grating on us um, and actually address them and use the right communication so that we're not doing it in an aggressive way, um, but we're actually doing it in an enabling, empowering way. And actually it offers us, the opportunity to have deeper relationships with people because we actually do learn to communicate better um, and they talk a lot about try not to tolerate those pinches too much because um they build up they build up they build up and they manifest inside of you and they're quite insidious actually over time and they kind of eat away at you and actually being able to vocalize those um is really important and again they talk about it like any kind of behavioral change it's a skill to be practiced and they give scripts and they give ways of doing it and I I, you know throughout kind of reading the book and knowing that I had the kind of book club to be accountable to I was you know trying these things out and it's hard it's really hard you know um but it's it's actually a really necessary part of being human and of human life and um it was really interesting and I think it reflects well and actually you're your comment on tolerance because I think that's really important of knowing what is it that we should tolerate what should we not and then how do we create that courage or that bravery to address that and to have the skills to be able to address it in a way that actually will maintain a relationship or deepen a relationship as a result I think that's such an important thing to to speak about and also you know we're not like I said we're not trained to kind of have relationships and essentially that's one of the biggest things in life, isn't it? You know, and then something I also think about is like how we're not trained to communicate well, you know, and specifically like have tough conversations, you know? So like mm-hmm. you said, like when you're feeling that pinch, you know, you, you, you need to have a, a method uh, and some sort of structure, like a thought out one. Okay, cool. How am I going to talk about this to the person that's that's doing whatever they are to me like how am I going to have this this tough conversation like what what do I need to do you know um how do I also tolerate not tolerate how do I also um manage uh my triggers like you know when I'm when somebody does something like often we get emotionally triggered you know Mm -hmm. and but we don't have the tools because we haven't thought about it you know we're not able to articulate uh what it is but so we just react like angrily, like yeah. a lot of the time, you know, and and even and, more so if the person's right, <laughs> mm, if they have pushed the right buttons, even more so. Yeah, exactly. So, so these are such like, like critical things, I think, for us to all just try become better at, um, mm. because it, it effectively just helps us, you know, personally, but also the people we're with, our relationships, um, how we perceived. Um, all these things, you know, for me, I don't know, I reckon communication is probably the most important skill that um, people don't give enough time to. Mm. I agree. And I, I would say communication with others and also communication with yourself. And and I go back to kind of what we said at, you know, the top of our conversation about knowing our own needs, because often, you know, when we have arguments, you know, Sometimes we're just having arguments for argument's sake because we've got some unfulfilled need in that way. Um, and they talk about in the book about taking a pause um, in an argument. And I, I find that really um, inspiring to kind of check in with yourself and say, you know, am I projecting my own agenda? Why is this thing actually this annoying to me? You know, beyond this person, you know, am I arguing just because I need to feel like I'm right? Or am I arguing because, you know, my values are compromised or, you know, it's something that's actually really vitally important to me. Um, And actually, again, it goes back to that self-awareness and knowing and understanding and able to nourishing your needs, which is our life's work as humans. You know, we're not going to get it uh, right all of the time. But like you say, if we come at it with an intent, with a curiosity and, and trying to, you know, create a consciousness around it, it can be really, really helpful and really supportive um, for the rest of our lives. Mm. 
Yeah, I love it. Um, you you speak my language there, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so, just um, sort of following on a little bit. Um, one of the things that uh, has obviously happened since um, since COVID and stuff is more people are uh, now working from home, and mm -hmm. you recently wrote a post. Uh, about uh -oh. uh, like work-life balance <laughs> and that you said spoiler alert there is no such thing as work-life balance and and I was very intrigued as to what you actually meant by that yeah great question um I suppose like my my, my point is that you know if we're sometimes there's just going to be more work and other times there's going to be more life and you know anyone who's a new parent would know that anyone who's like an accountant and at certain times of the month where things are crazy will know that and so if we're trying to like balance one out with the other constantly you know it's it's often fighting a battle that we can never win and and a certain level of um kind of managing our life is is about acceptance about accepting that this is a busy time for me and actually I'm not going to get all of the things that I need to get done in done in this time how can I deprioritize everything that's not in this bubble right now um I'm not, I'm not saying that so you neglect your basic needs like your physical health and and all of these other things but it you know when you we go through busy periods about it's about asking yourself a question am, am I actually just making things harder for myself by adding more in rather than looking at what I can take away um, and and that's what I mean about balance it's not about stacking things up and, and stacking the other things up and because what if you have loads of work does that mean that you have to spend every spare you know minute um you know resting or recovering on the couch you know that's not necessarily gonna balance you out either and again, it comes back to understanding what your needs are. You know, there's multiple different types of rest for people. So while you might be working really hard all day and um, you might have had no social time and, and, and that might be what you need to restore yourself. But it doesn't mean that if you've worked for eight hours, you need eight hours of social time, um, which is, you know, if we if we talk about trying to work life balance on that way, that's what it's trying to achieve. It's not about that. It's about having a balance of, of activities that, work well for you that restore you but not trying to be at odds with one another because in essence our work is so is so blended with our lives right now and um, that it's very very hard to kind of separate the two and if we're trying to work in that really kind of um kind of segregated way and um, it can often create more stress for people now this is very different than boundaries and I think that boundaries are very very important and um, I'm not saying you know like work should seep into your weekends or your evenings or anything like that I'm saying sometimes it will and and we have to create a certain level of acceptance around that but I think that we shouldn't put ourselves under pressure to be constantly trying to balance and, and juggle everything because we we can't juggle all of the things all of the time and um, I did a kind of a recent um talk on this um and I talked about this theory called the four burners theory um and so uh I think it was James Clear I first heard it off but it's a theory in cognitive science anyway that um there's four rings on a hob like on, on the on the top of an oven we call it a hob in our in Ireland I don't know they call it burners in the US I think and you've got your friends your family your health and your career and it's very, very difficult to keep four pots on the boil at any time. You know, it's quite stressful. We have to kind of monitor them. Um, and so in order to kind of feel like we're balanced in life or feel like we're succeeding in life, we often need to just let go of two. And in order to really succeed at something, we actually need to just focus on one. So it might be in, at a time of our life, you know, when we're really focused on career, maybe we're not as focused on our friends and family or at a time of our life we're really focused on family maybe we are going to have to let our career burner go down a little bit um, and I did this workshop recently with a group of MDs and it, they said it was quite relieving for them in a way because it gave them permission to say well actually do you know what that's not a priority right now I'm in a real career phase and I'm not going to be able to go out and see friends 
every other night or have a really active social life and that's okay because that's for now um, and and this is where I want to focus my energy because I want to push the needle a lot in this area whereas if we're trying to push the needle in all four areas all at once it can get really really difficult now that's not to say that you can completely neglect your social life and focus everything on work because that is a complete mismatch of balance but it's saying that you know everything's on a scale and a scale of one to ten for socializing you know ten out of ten might be out with your friends every night what's a one a one might be just having a quick 15 minute phone call at lunchtime with someone um or popping into someone for a cup of tea you know once a month and so this is what i mean about balance it's about acknowledging well what's a priority for you right now you know if you're a new parent you might not have the same amount of time to go to the gym so in you know in a gym going to the gym three times a week might be your 10 out of 10 but what's a one for you maybe it's doing five push-ups you know while the kettle boils or um you know walking your daughter around the park and um, before you you drop them off at their play group whatever it happens to be it's like we don't have to just be all or nothing we need to focus on our priorities first and then we can scale up and down those other areas of our life that are important to us too i think your four burners are on fire right now with all the advice that you're dropping like i, oh, I totally love that i think it's um just don't such a great an- don't take it all at once just uh, one thing <laughs> it's just it's it's a great analogy as well you know i think there's mm. a it's a nice way to explain things for people to kind of picture it and and realize you know that it's okay to kind of like turn the gas down on one of them and yeah. just focus on the other um it's it's interesting i, I I personally have been like trying to find the joy in things that I, that I do that are like chores. Right. Mm. Um, so for example, like I, I really love hanging the washing up these days, you know, and it's like, my house, then. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that we were speaking about this actually, but like, um, you know, like I, I, I really look for the joy. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, actually I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm washing my, my family's clothes. I'm, I'm getting to hang, hang it up. And, you know, you know, this is allowing them to kind of, you know, feel comfortable and nice and look good uh, once they all dry and folded and stuff. And I think it's like such an important thing for us to do is to actually seek how we can enjoy things that like might be like chorish and Mm. it allows us to kind of be quite present, you know, or more present at least. Um, And you know, not, not look at things as chores, but okay, cool. I'm, I'm actually really enjoying this. I don't know if there's any kind of like thoughts around that, that you have. Oh, loads. Um, so definitely on the joy part, you know, I, I say, if you can find joy, you know, the rest becomes easy. Um, and, and what I mean by that, if we, if we think about this from, I'll talk about this in two ways, talk about this in terms of what you're doing, which is habit stacking, but I'll talk about first, maybe joy more globally, because it's one of my favorite topics um but uh you know so often when we want to make change happen in our lives or where we want to achieve something in our lives you know we try and make things more difficult for ourselves rather than easier um so if we take the example of you know looking after our physical health you know like we'll go to the gym and we'll join and the first day we'll scan on the gym floor and we'll look for okay what's the most punishing or difficult um you know exercise machine that I can use okay the assault bike or the stairmaster that looks the hardest so that's what I'll start with first or if we you know um want to eat healthily we look you know we go to the supermarket and we're like right um kale is what all the healthy people eat I'm gonna ha- eat loads of that or I'm gonna have like steamed chicken for the rest of my days or whatever and you know like a weekend we get bored we fall off track um and there's a really interesting study on this where they got two groups they looked at women walkers and they told one of the groups that they needed to go out for the next three months and walk for the benefits that it gives them back and um the other group they said go out and walk for fun just find joy in your walking do it for fun um, and they followed up in three months and the most consistent walkers were those in the for fun group but what the sneaky psychology researchers did which is quite interesting was that they um, when they got the women to fill out these psychometric questionnaires so asking them um, different elements about like you know their confidence their walking habits all of these different elements and um, they put M&Ms next to them while they were filling them out and they measured how many people ate 
And in the For Joy group, they had half as many as the Exercise for Benefit group. And their hypothesis was that in the For Joy group, they didn't feel like they were part of some regime where they had to exercise willpower or they had to curse themselves into the change. And therefore they didn't rebel in the form in the form of eating loads of heaven ends. Whereas those for benefit, the ones that thought that they should do it and they had to do it for the recommendations, they were the ones that ate more because they were rebelling against it. Um, and there's a phrase I like to use around this and it's from Mary Poppins, which says in every job that must be done, there's an element of fun. If we find the fun and snap the jobs a game and you know you'll know this gareth as a dad you know like if we want children to exercise you know we bring them to the jungle gym or you know we make fun games we want them to eat vegetables we make them into the shape of dinosaurs and yet like you know we don't treat ourselves with the same level of playfulness the same level of fun um, and actually studies show time and time again that actually if we can find the joy like i say the rest becomes easy because we're unlocking a type of sticky motivation known as intrinsic motivation and and you know that's that and um, it translates in latin into inward or goods for your soul that's the type of motivation that keeps us engaged and so if we can make things playful if we can make them joyful if we can make them more fun in whatever way we want to like you're you know you're hanging up the washing and you're you're telling yourself well this is something i'm doing for my family and look at how cute these little socks are and you know i really enjoy this this element and you know that's that's one way to do it and um, another way is to kind of layer joy into things so you know if you um you know you're doing weight training and you find it quite difficult but you love like heavy metal music you know and that makes you more likely to kind of get stuck in and really kind of rip things apart or you know batch cooking for you is really boring or ironing so you like only watch your favorite um you know streaming uh, uh videos at that time you know it makes it more likely that you'll want to engage in in that behavior and even actually priming yourself and um, this is um some work I did with a, a company over in the US and we looked at um, different modalities of exercise and motivation and actually we could people could really prime themselves and make them more likely to engage and um, if they thought about how they feel at the end and um, so you know so often we lie in bed thinking about oh geez I don't want to go for a run this morning or it's washing rain and oh like it's so painful on my knees and oh I have to like cycle past that woman that always kind of throws her eyes up at me or whatever it happens to be and then you know I'm going to get mud on my shoes if we start to think about oh I'm going to feel amazing when I come in for that shower oh I'm just going to get that sense of clarity or sense of accomplishment or oh I love actually when it rains because when I come in I feel like you know like doing those final few steps I feel like rocky and um you know, if we can focus on what it gives us back, if we can focus on the joy, it makes it much more likely that we're going to want to engage and we're actually priming our brain for joyful experiences. Um, and that's why it's so important to, to focus on fun, even from a neurophysiological point of view, because if we can prime our brain for, for happiness, for, for gratefulness, for enjoyment, even for play, um, it activates a dopamine receptor response. So actually it tells our brain this is something good to do and it, it reminds it let's do this again and again and again it makes it more likely that it will do it again whereas if we say this is really hard and this is difficult and this is such a slog we're telling our brain this is not something i want to engage with beware stay away do not engage um and so a pragmatic thing that people can do off the back of this um rant about joy is that um you know if you're starting to create change in your life or you want to create certain change in your life say you know it's a change to your physical health write down you know what are those activities that bring you joy what are those physical health activities that bring you joy is it that you know going for a hike up the mountain with your dog makes you feel free or um even you know going for a walk in a matter with a friend or a colleague at lunchtime just you know like lifts your spirit and um, you know don't you know do spinning because everyone else does spinning and you absolutely hate it and you're clock watching all the time you know think about the things that you enjoy and start with with the joy um instead of making things harder for yourself so create that joy list for any aspect of change you want to create in your life and then for those chores or those things that you find a little bit more difficult ask yourself well, how can i layer in joy how can i make this a more joyful experience or and, you know, not everything is a joyful experience. So, you know, I'm trying to do my 
business financial accounts you know it's not a joyful experience for me um but I listen to nice music when I do it I promise myself a nice cup of tea at the end and I also ask myself what contribution does this make to my life you know what is this giving me back rather than resisting it thinking about well actually this makes me feel more confident as a business owner I'm going to feel so great when I finish this actually it's another task done and if we can kind of think and prime ourselves in that way it makes it more likely that we'll engage and it brings that motivation Mm. love it (laughs) that is so great um having a daughter like and playing with her has literally reminded me how much I love playing as a kid like honestly like she 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 just loves going outside um and you know if i turn the water on we are getting dirty <laughs> there's there's enough sand in the grass in our garden to make it muddy and we will be getting muddy like doesn't matter how cold it is or whatever um but it's just it's been such a refreshing reminder for me like how important play is and just how good it is for the soul as well and yeah, it's amazing how we almost become programmed, or well, not almost, we do become programmed as adults to stop playing, to stop getting dirty, to like saying, no, 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 don't do that. And we really kind of need to uh, sort of assess ourselves, don't we, you know, constantly and go, okay, cool. You know, actually, no, this is, um, this is because of your programming, Gareth, you must you must kind of like try and change, you know, and, and just have a bit more fun and stuff because it's, it just, I think it's just really good for the soul and people, I think people need that, you know, um, to have that fun. And yeah, it's just a really il- important element of, of who we are. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for saying it. Um, I, I was wondering like you, say some really interesting like things about the studies that you, um, you know, you read and, and hear about, like, is, do you have to be part of like some sort of organization or um, have some sort of credentials to read these sort of studies? Like, where do you find them if people are interested themselves in learning a bit more about sort of behavior science and psychology? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think, like, yeah, it was very much easy when you're part of an academic community, but as soon as you leave, you've got to make a little bit more effort. Um, a lot of people find Twitter really good for it. Um, you know, if you start following behavioral scientists on Twitter or LinkedIn, um, they often are, like, people like me are often shouting about, uh, you know, the latest study or whatever else. I'm lucky enough that a lot of people send them to me. Um, but I'm also part of a few um, really good newsletters Um so I would recommend um, uh, Habit Weekly. Um, it's a brilliant newsletter from Samuel Salser. Um, and it talks about all things habit and behavior change. And it's really fun and engaging. And um, he gives kind of latest books. He gives case studies. It's all uh, very interesting. And I get a lot of insight from them. Um, there's a newsletter called The Behavioral Scientist, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, And there's a team over in Canada called the Decision Lab who also have a brilliant uh, newsletter. And so for me, it's actually, you know, people sending me bits um, and following those kind of three newsletters that really kind of helps me. Um, I'm also part of some kind of informal behavioral science groups as well, um, where we meet and we talk about kind of latest findings in the field. Again, because it's quite hard when you step away from the academic community that's a big that was a big loss for me was you know I'm not in touch with the latest findings and I'm not having anyone challenge my views or beliefs as well which I think is really important you know you can't operate in isolation and I need people to be disagreeing with me and and telling me actually no that's not right or we haven't found that um, being successful in our field I think when you work as a consultant and and they kind of are an n of one and you know often you can start to believe your own hypotheses maybe a little bit too much and so it's important to kind of um, be expanded into that um, there's also really good um, and I think the behavioral scientists do this as well they do like a summer reading list um, of kind of key behavioral science books to engage with I would certainly recommend as a starting point there's a brilliant book um, called Good Habits Bad Habits 
by uh, Dr. Wendy Wood. Um, but anyone who wants to really nerd out on habit change and behavior change, that's a great place to start. And it's a very evidence-based place to start. Um, I would also always recommend Atomic Habits by James Clear. I think it's a really accessible um, read. It's, it's not necessarily written by a scientist. He's certainly a, a very, very skilled um, communicator and he's a real craftsman in terms of actually understanding human behavior. Um, I think that might be enough homework for people to get started, but it's certainly, and also if anyone has any interest in a certain area of behavioral science or the studies I've mentioned, please yeah, reach out to me on LinkedIn and ask me. I love getting questions. I'm always collecting questions. I'm always curious to know what other people want to know as well. Um, so I'm always willing to be your behavioral science friend um, and companion. Um, and yeah, always willing and, and happy to receive questions as well. Well, I think you're going to have a lot of people messaging you <laughs> to want to be your behavioral scientist friend, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I really like your honesty about how important it is to to be challenged in your own thoughts and uh, your own worldviews and stuff. And, and that's like a very healthy trait to have. Um, I, don't, I, I think too many people do get kind of like stuck in their own beliefs and, and thoughts. And um, that's kind of a, a real damaging almost damaging trait to have, you know, to, to not be open to be challenged and have your thoughts changed. I think that's a, a really strong character that, that you have there. So thanks for mentioning that. I, I, was, I think yeah. on that note as well, um, I think it's important to understand that there's more than being right or wrong. Um, we can often be in between. <laughs> um, we can be unsure. We can be yet to be convinced. We can be, I need an update on my knowledge around that. Um, and I think that we we have to actually, as people, um, in order to not live in an anxiety, a society of extremes, we have to actually allow ourselves to not have to fit into wrong or right or one or the other. And actually understand that understanding views, values, um, often are on a scale and that scale can change over time. And we have to be willing to understand and acknowledge um, you know how our views can change over time as well so I'm always willing to be wrong and educated about something um, in a different way. One of the best podcasts that I listened to in the last couple of years was uh, Jewel the singer uh, she was on Joe Rogan and uh, it's, it's like wow what an amazing lady uh, but one of the things that she said in there is she's like there's a there's a thing called the the Socratic dialectic method which is basically when you have two people that are speaking with each other that have like opposing views mm. and a third thing is found out right so that sort of ties in nicely with what you're saying there you know like you could have a certain view on something I could have the polar opposite view on that but we actually decide to have a mature conversation about it and out of that comes a third Thing that we find out and I think that's like such an important thing you know especially in these times where it, I feel like people don't want to listen right and they they, they want to get their point across more than anything and it, it feels like we're in so many fights you know what I mean like and, and not really wanting to understand other people's point of view so um yeah once again like just a just a nice thing for us to to really think about and be conscious of um, yeah, and if people want a bit of homework on that one, um, there's a great uh, book called The Scout Mindset, um, which is all about um, exactly this, you know, um, about how to kind of live at peace with people with, that have opposing views on, as you and, and how to kind of um, navigate that and have conversations around it. Again, it's not a skill that we are trained in. And so, you know, it's certainly not a skill that I've been trained in. And so learning about it and learning more about how to manage that and um, I think it's really important. I'm wondering if you're a bit of a mind reader, because one of my questions that I, that I like to almost uh, sort of come to, well, bring things to, to a close with is uh, what are two books that have kind of really shifted your kind of worldview and perspective on things or really helped you in life? I mean, you've already mentioned three books, but I, I mean, you know, maybe <laughs> there's a couple of other great oh, ones yeah. there that you could you could throw in um that uh, that people could also find useful themselves yeah this is a really great question i'm just looking at my isn't it i so said there's a concept in behavioral science called recency bias where we can only really remember 
what we uh what, what we read recently rather than actually what was most profound but i definitely think that connect book that i mentioned earlier was had a real impact on me because um like you said you know we never really learn how to have relationships and yet it's so integral to everything that we do and how to manage conflict in our relationships and while i wouldn't say i'm perfect at it in any way you know i'm working on it um which i think is is quite important and i i also always love books that actually are often not just conceptual but challenge you and it's a pain at the time because you're reading it and you're like oh do I have to go and try this out on someone now this is going to be so um effortful and annoying but actually um you know it, it's it's worth it in the end and taking that action um I'm trying to think of what else yeah it's quite funny because I was talking with um, my husband about this last night because I was asking him what books have really influenced him you know what were a turning point for him in his life and, and influenced his his point of view um and I think one book for me um uh it's actually a, a non-fiction but um is educated um it's a really really interesting book about a woman that comes from a highly religious um family and actually is unaware of how the rest of the world operates as a result but manages to kind of break out of that family over time and go on to um you know incredible studies and has this incredible life story but I think what's really important about the book is it teaches us that we can have such a narrowed world view depending on who we surround ourselves with um and our own environment and actually having the bravery and the courage to step outside of that and actually meet other people and um, that have a completely different worldview and, and the importance of that and so I'm always looking for opportunities and meet other people that do have a, a different worldview and um, can um, I suppose challenge um, my own personal beliefs and, and and show me what it means to be human in their in their own kind of ways and manners um, and I find that book quite profound in inspiring me to do that. You're giving me a hell of a lot of homework here so I'm really looking forward <laughs> yeah. to to tacking into those books right. and, and to the newsletters that's for sure. Uh, it actually reminds me we, we had a fascinating lady uh, Lilia Tarawa uh, she's a Kiwi lady on our podcast who was part of a cult like a Christian cult wow. um, and she's she's like done a, a TED talk and written a book and stuff and she eventually got out of this this cult in New Zealand it's, it was called Gloria Vale and mm -hmm. my goodness like talk about brainwashing on another level and um, then coming out into the world as like what you know you mean I don't have to wear the same clothes and um that actually people are nice people and you know what I mean it was like that mm. you know so her story is a fascinating I, I one think I'm sorry to interrupt but like um it's just more to contribute but it's almost like that's like at the extreme level of what we talked about where you know everyone feels like they have to commute because that's what everyone does or we all have to be on social media because that's what everyone does or we have to have the house tidy when people come around because that's the right thing to do or whatever I know that that you know from cults to washing is, 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 is a wide um spectrum but it's it's I think what's beautiful about experiencing those and though you might be like well how can I relate to this person well actually that's on it you know a scale of 10 one well, you're all the way back maybe to one but that's what it looks like for you and it causes us to check in you know and be like oh actually maybe there are things that actually in my worldview are very narrow because of a product of my environment and actually things don't necessarily have to be that way there's so much for all of us to learn uh, from each other I think and um, that's always the beauty of life is that there is always so much to learn and that we are on this journey and we're all constantly evolving uh, so Dr. Heather I was wondering is there anything about the future that you are excited about either like personally or uh, from a business perspective and um, where can people get in touch with you if they want to just sort of find out more and touch base yeah great question um what am I excited about well I'm I I bought a house um so I'm going to move into that into um, about a month's time actually which I'm super excited about um and kind of wait and I've got a big garden which has been long been one of my dreams um lots of trees and um yeah so let's see what my skills are like as a gardener but it's certainly uh something I'm excited about um I'm also excited about a lot of more face-to-face -face work is coming back. I find a lot more teams now want to work 
face to face and um, even speaking engagements are starting to like, you know, they're starting to be way more uh, in person, which, you know, one of my biggest joys is after I do talk on habits is actually meeting people in the conference afterwards and people come up and they'll tell me their personal stories or you know different things like that and I just I just get so much joy from that so you know it just it makes me um so happy to understand how people operate but also then maybe how a little bit of the behavior change literature it causes a shift in their mindset or a little bit of a penny drop um moment for them um which is possibly the most exciting part of, of my work um yeah, I suppose those are things that I'm really excited about, you know, kind of getting back in the mix, seeing more people and um, face to face and working with more teams face to face. And then, yeah, my upcoming move. I'll send you pictures of the garden. It'll be a mess, but sure, it'll be mine. <laughs> that sounds super cool. I'm, I'm really excited for that move for you. Uh, I think I have such faith in like the human spirit that, you know, our human needs and our tendencies will kind of rise and, you know, we will realize okay cool we do need that that community that in-person sort of um socializing and events and stuff like more than mm -hmm. anything so i'm sure those things are just going to sort of carry on coming back more and more um where can people get in touch with you or follow you on websites or, or social media yeah great question um so i am on linkedin i'm dr heather mckee on linkedin surprise surprise m-c-k-e-e -E um and i'm not on other social medias um mainly because it just doesn't serve me it's not a level of support that works for me um but i have a website which is dr heather mckee uh dot co and um, so dot co or dot co dot uk as well um and yeah there you can find all the articles and the podcasts and different bits about the consultancy i work i do companies and the speaking work and all of the fun bits and um, you can also contact me and ask me your behavior change questions which i'm always willing to hear so um yeah that's dr uk. that's cool you have a beautiful website as well it's very it's very neat it's easy to navigate and it's like it's full of oh, that's nice, all thanks concise to my information. wonderful website designer um martin from erin studios he's incredible um and yeah i'd be lost without him that's super cool. And then my last question is, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Yeah, oh, great question. Sorry, it's extended pause. <laughs> this is <laughs> important. Funny. Yeah, it is an important question. I think it means um, understanding and knowing yourself and and. And therefore bringing that same kind of level of compassion and understanding to others, or even flipping it the other way and, you know, doing your best to be compassionate and understanding of how others operate and how everyone has their own lives and different influencers and things that are um, different quirks. You know, sometimes people say, oh, that person's weird because they do that. Whereas I adore that because I'm like, oh, I love weirdness like because that's essentially what makes us human. It's all these curiosities that we have and all these little quirks and um i think appreciating that you know we all have that and we're all kind of different in so many ways but we're also quite similar in so many ways and having that appreciation i think is really what yeah being human is all about i can't thank you enough seriously for for coming on this podcast like it's been it's like been everything i i sort of like wanted i knew it was going to be such an awesome chat you have like an incredible mind uh, you articulate yourself so well and there was just like an absolute ton of value in this conversation it's like one of those ones that I know I'm going to go back to and I'm going to take a lot of notes and I'm going to really enjoy re-listening to you and you know just the the way you are as well like super energetic in terms of like positivity and and happiness and like very smiley and that is amazing. So thank you for like showing up with that sort of intent. It's, it's, it's really kind of noticeable and really engaging and warm. So mm -hmm. thanks again for coming on, on the show. It's like just an absolute privilege always speaking to you and just like listening to your mind uh, speak in real time. So thank you, Dr. Heather. I feel so lucky to be asked back, even after five years, <laughs> even after a long hiatus, we've reunited again. So I'm really grateful for that. 
Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you.